Appendicitis is the inflammation of the vermiform appendix. It is a common cause of acute abdominal pain and a common surgical emergency. Appendicitis can occur at any age, but is most common during the teenage years. This video clip will look at the anatomy underlying the symptoms and signs of acute appendicitis at presentation, and a brief review of the anatomy necessary to understand an open appendicectomy. Let's consider a typical case. A 12-year-old boy presented with a cramp-like pain around his umbilicus of a few hours duration. He was feeling nauseous and the pain started to get worse. On questioning, the pain had become more severe and sharper in character and it had moved towards the right iliac fossa. On examination, he had a slightly elevated temperature his abdomen was not distended and he had rebound tenderness in the right iliac fossa. There were no other clinical findings of note and his urine dipstick was normal. A provisional diagnosis of acute appendicitis was made. The appendix is found inferiorly on the medial border of the cecum. It's a blind ending appendage, typically about 8 centimeters in length, but can go up to about 20 centimeters. The appendix is rich in lymphoid tissue and it has circular and longitudinal muscle layers, the latter being continuous with the tinea coli, of which there are three bands that I've drawn in here. The appendix can be located following the three bands of tinea coli to their origin, which is at the base of the appendix. This is very useful during surgery, particularly when the appendix is hard to find. Zooming in closer to the appendix, one can see that it has a mesentery called the mesoappendix, which is attached to the terminal ileum inferiorly. Behind the ileum, you can see the appendicular artery, which then runs between the layers of the mesoappendix in order to reach the appendix to supply it. The appendicular artery is a branch of the ileocolic artery, which in turn is a branch of the superior mesenteric artery, which arises from the abdominal aorta. The venous drainage of the appendix is via vessels to the superior mesenteric vein and into the portal system. During an appendicectomy, the mesentery and the blood vessels in it must be divided in order to mobilize the appendix prior to its removal. As the appendix is on a mesentery, it is a mobile organ, and it can be found in a number of positions relative to the cecum, as shown in the diagram here. In about 65% of cases, the appendix can be found tucked up behind the cecum in a position known as a retrocecal position. You will recall that the cecum can be one of the areas of the gastrointestinal tract that is intraperitoneal, so there can be a place for the appendix to tuck itself up behind there. Or it can be found pointing down inferiorly in about 30% of cases, and then for the balance it can go around in any position on the clock face as indicated here but these two are the commonest positions that are found. The position of the appendix is important in understanding the signs and symptoms of how acute appendicitis may present. Different positions means that different contiguous organs may be irritated by the inflammatory process in the appendix depending on where it lies, and hence appendicitis does not always present in the classic way described in this case. In this video, we will only consider a cecum that is in the right iliac fossa. However, be aware that if there has been a degree of malrotation of the gut during development, the cecum may not even be in the right iliac fossa, but positioned elsewhere in the abdomen. But we'll leave that for later in your surgical course. Let's now look at the initial symptoms in this case, namely the colicky pain around the umbilicus and the nausea. Appendicitis is associated with obstruction of the appendix lumen that communicates with the cecum.
Whatever the cause of the obstruction, this ultimately leads to an inflammatory process affecting the wall of the appendix. In this diagram, we can see the various layers of the appendix wall in cross-section. We will work our way in from the outside towards the middle where the lumen lies. You can see, colored in blue, the serosa, which forms the visceral peritoneum, and this is continuous with the mesoappendix meso superiorly, and you can see the artery, the appendicular artery running through the mesoappendix, running to reach the walls over here. After the peritoneum, we see the outer longitudinal layer of muscle that is continuous with the tinea coli of the colon, and then the inner circular layer of muscle, which is between the submucosa and the outer longitudinal layer. The submucosa has been colored in purple here because it contains a lot of lymphoid tissue. The mucosal surface uh, is lined with epithelium and we can see here the crypts of Lieberkuhn down at the bottom over here. When the lumen becomes obstructed, possibly by a fecal lith or lymphoid swelling, the muscle layers contract in an attempt to overcome the obstruction. These contractions are painful and cause cramping that is detected by the visceral sensory nerves in the appendix. The cramping or colicky pain is associated with nausea as well as the colic or cramps that are focused around where the umbilicus lies. You will recall that the gastrointestinal tract is supplied by visceral sensory fibers that localize pain very poorly. These visceral fibers from the appendix reach the central nervous system where the cramping sensation gets referred to the T10 dermatome along which the umbilicus lies. The patient thus interprets the cramping pain as originating at the umbilicus. An inflammatory process resulting from the cause of the obstruction starts to spread through the thickness of the wall of the appendix up to and including the serosal or visceral peritoneum. If the inflamed appendix lies up against parietal peritoneum, as it often does, for example, in the right iliac fossa, then the parietal peritoneum also becomes inflamed and painful as a result of localized peritonitis. The parietal peritoneum is very sensitive to pain arising from inflammation, and it has a somatic sensory innervation that enables accurate localization of the origin of the pain in the right iliac fossa. The nature of the pain is sharp, and pressing on it or stretching it elicits a marked response from the patient. So now we have two more symptoms that we can explain in the original presentation. The one is the movement of the pain into the right iliac fossa, and the other is the change in the nature of that pain. I'll just remove the appendix drawing, and then we can see the other two features that we've described here under three and four. Now the rebound tenderness, which can be felt in the right iliac fossa at clinical examination, involves stretching the peritoneum by pushing firmly down into the abdomen and then suddenly releasing it so that the parietal peritoneum suddenly receives a stretching sensation which is very painful to the patient, so it has to be done very carefully. So in summary, we've had a patient who presented with nausea and periumbilical discomfort as a consequence of the cramping pain from the appendix, which then gets referred to the T10 dermatome distribution. And as the inflammation then starts to go through the wall of the appendix and parietal peritoneum starts to be involved in the inflammatory process, the pain then becomes localized to the right iliac fossa and is much sharper in nature than the original vaguely localized 
colicky periambilical pain. Then one more feature of note is that the boy had a raised temperature on presentation. This happens a little uh, further down the line in acute appendicitis as it starts to localize in the right iliac fossa and there may be suppuration or abscess formation starting to occur and the body mounts a, a systemic response to that with a raise in white cell count and uh, increased temperature. But these signs do not need to be present for the early diagnosis of acute appendicitis. The definitive treatment of appendicitis is appendicectomy, and this is often done through an incision in the right iliac fossa, although nowadays laparoscopic techniques are also used. A typical incision will be made in the right iliac fossa over a point known as McBurney's point. This point coincides with the base of the appendix and is found as follows. If you draw a line between the anterior superior iliac spine and the umbilicus and divide the line up into thirds, then the junction between the outer third and the middle third co uh, coincides with the base of the appendix, just over here. Access to the appendix in this region requires a cut through the anterior abdominal wall and a knowledge of the various layers encountered before reaching the uh, site of the appendix. So in the next slide we'll have a look at those layers. On this view we can see the pants that the patient was wearing have been taken down a little bit so we can see more of the groin over here. The asterisk that represents the uh, anterior superior iliac spine and then the umbilicus. And there's McBurney's point at the junction of the outer third and inner two thirds. An incision therefore needs to be made in this region and we'll have a look at the layers as they appear. In the incision you can see the edge of it over here with the skin and the underlying superficial fascia and then the layers of the abdominal wall as one goes through uh, reaching as far down as the peritoneum at the bottom of the cut. So let's have a closer look in at this and we can see what each of the different layers is as we would go through during surgery. So over here we've got the external marking of the anterior superior iliac spine and over here is the umbilicus and this is the incision that's been made over McBurney's point. On the periphery over here we can see the skin as it's been cut through and then this yellow layer represents the superficial fascial layer which consists of two separate parts, a more superficial fatty bit and a slightly deeper fibrous layer. And here is the external abdominal oblique muscle. You can see the fleshy parts over here running into the external oblique aponeurosis, which I'm indicating with the arrow. And during the operation, uh, once the superficial fascia has been incised and pushed aside, then a cut is made into the aponeurosis to separate it out, uh, and then it's separated further uh, in line with the fibers, the way the fibers run of the external oblique. Remember the direction is downwards and medially, or hands in pockets position for the way in which the external oblique fibers run. Then there are the internal abdominal oblique muscle fibers which are indicated over here and you'll notice that they go in a different position. In other words they go upwards and medially as opposed to the downwards and medially of the external oblique. So upwards and medially or if you prefer hands in back pockets that goes downward and laterally. These fibers are split rather than cut during surgery because it's painful to cut muscles if you don't need to cut them. And they're then pulled apart and held open. The cut is held open by retractors. And then the third layer of muscle, the transversus abdominis muscles, they run transversely across the abdomen. And you can see their fibers outlined here.
these fibers are also uh, separated like the internal abdominal oblique muscles and expose the underlying peritoneum and extraperitoneal tissue. This tissue over here then is carefully uh, incised by picking it up in a pair of forceps checking that there's no bowel underneath and once a cut is made in there one then gets access to the peritoneal cavity and can then start looking for the uh, appendix. You can imagine that looking for where the appendix might lie through the small hole requires a number of anatomical skills and that's where being able to recognize the colon versus small intestine can be so useful and following the tinea coli down to their origin at the base of where the appendix should lie. Once the operation is over then the various layers here are closed with sutures and the finally, uh, finally the skin is then closed and the operation is complete. So let's review now the case uh, as it was when it first presented. A 12 year old boy who presented with cramp-like pain around his umbilicus of a few hours duration. This cramp-like pain was visceral in origin. The appendix was contracting in an attempt to overcome a possible uh, obstruction and that pain is then referred along visceral fibers to the central nervous system where our brains then interpret it as coming from the umbilicus because the visceral feed-in is at the same level as the T10 dermatome and the T10 dermatome is the one in which the umbilicus lies. The pain then migrates down to the right iliac fossa. Uh, the consequence of the peritonitic process going through from the visceral peritoneum to the parietal peritoneum and the parietal peritoneum has got a somatic innervation and so the pain becomes much more localized. It also changes in character from the crampy colicky pain to this sharp pain which is uh, elicited particularly on examining the abdomen and performing the rebound tenderness test. So I think we've covered most of the anatomy that you need to know for that, but you will notice here that there is one more finding that we haven't referred to, and that is the question of his urine dipstick being normal. And that is just to remind us that there are a number of different causes of abdominal pain which need to be excluded uh, in people presenting with appendicitis-like symptoms. Remember that not all appendicitis symptoms are present at one time in the same patient. Symptoms at presentation can vary depending on the anatomy. So, for example, if the appendix is tucked right up behind the cecum, it may be that it doesn't cause uh, a parietal peritonitis at all, and therefore the pain fails to migrate in the typical fashion to the right iliac fossa. If the appendicitis, appendix is in a strange part of the body, it may irritate another organ in the abdomen, and symptoms referable to that organ may arise. Uh, if the appendix is very long, it may even go right down into the pelvis and cause gastrointestinal problems, bladder problems, etc. So the reason for just stating um, a bit of a red herring here about the urine dipsticks being normal is to remind you to keep an open mind about different causes of abdominal pain. Uh, when you do your surgery, you will learn how to separate out and make a reasonable diagnosis based on a history and your clinical findings. It is not uncommon for a provisional diagnosis of appendicitis to be made only to find at surgery that the appendix appears normal. One has to bear in mind that there are a number of causes of acute abdominal pain that can mimic acute appendicitis and you'll become more familiar with these when you do your surgery course. However, for the purposes of this case, you could consider Meckel's diverticulum and it would be worth looking up the embryology briefly and the reasons why it could present in such a way.